Yeah, let, let's get started. Um, today we actually have a look at uh, what, what is described in organizational theory as a post-modernism or, or post-Fordist uh, organization and the new workplace. And it relates directly to our team environment and as well the emotions that we are kind of expected to illustrate at work. Now that, that doesn't have to make much sense yet. Uh, well, I hope you have read the chapter, but uh, aside of that, uh, um, we are trying to really get our head around the difference between the Fordist and post-Fordist organizations. So again, keep in mind, Fordist was kind of this uh, trailing of time at work. Yeah, so we, we have a lot of leftovers still of that. But it was as well about structure, clear roles, and uh, a, a clear allocation of work, right? But we have a look at that. Then uh, there is the Foucault's ideas of disciplinary power. And that is not so much to say that uh, um, you are being disciplined by uh, a leader or something, but it's the settled forces of society. And actually in the work environment we have a few examples where we can actually look at that. So how it actually applies to the organizational control, and we use it in projects a lot, yeah? but uh, there, there will be the uh, um, allocation of that anyway. So then you have as well the role of the teams in the post fordist organization. So this was actually an invention kind of from the 60s. There were some trials already. So um, the case study in the book chapter is about the miners, right? So they, they were kind of the inventors of the team. And it comes, of course, together with the invention, more or less, of what project management became nowadays, right? And then the role of emotions is a new, uh, a more recent element, so came together with the culture movement. So this is in the new service economy. And here, service economy is even in the workplace, right? So this is basically the recognition that uh, you too, as an employee, will be expected to kind of uh, um, show certain emotions as of compassion or, or maybe commitment at least to work. Yeah? And then the nature of no color work and its place in organizations today. Again, this is a theory buddy, but we have a look at applications in the project environment and I have some uh, exercises as well. Okay, so what is actually the postmodern uh, um, organization or where is this coming from? So uh, first of all, we, we have to recognize that we were kind of modern, yeah? And I'm, I'm not sure how you have followed the strung of the book chapters, but postmodern is this notion that we don't just uh, um, go into a world uh, of, of time of committing to a life career, yeah? So your parents may have had uh, um, a committed uh, um, life towards a career, they may have been a teacher, they may have been uh, um, a worker in a shipyard, they may have been uh, um, a farmer or, or something like that, and it's an identity for life. Now here, it's kind of the, well, so if you were a worker, you may have an organization that, that is bureaucratic in nature, and, and we may still have that, but uh, um, this is kind of an um, organization model that is running out of time. And you too will actually, in your project organizations, most likely not have to have a bureaucracy. So you may have uh, interaction with bureaucratic organizations, like governments, yeah? so a lot of them are still bureaucratic organizations, but uh, um, there is actually a move towards more flexibility. Now, so here in the past, we had the rejection of principles of the modernist uh, bureaucratic organization. So this was stability, hierarchy, clear structure, and function, right? So you as an uh, um, employee in the company would know your role. It would be very concise. You would be part of a department or uh, um, maybe business unit, whatever, yeah? But here you had stability, hierarchy, so you had a clear uh, um, uh, well, if you were a subordinate, you had a clear uh, uh, manager that looked after you, yeah, and a clear structure and a clear function, yeah. And this was, uh, um, well, now we, we have actually the opposite. Now we are kind of in a constant change. Uh, um, this is even perceived as instability. Yeah? So instability may be as uh, um, having to apply for new projects. Yeah. So uh, um, yeah, so simplified. If you're a project manager. Normally, you get nowadays a contract for a project. Yeah, you may be full-time employed with a company, but still, you will be competing for project-to-project -project work. Yeah? And this creates a certain instability. So on a project, if you take a long holiday, people will get really upset with you. But if you actually take the holiday between projects, then you are seen as somebody that works with the company. Yeah? So, and, and this instability wasn't, of course, there before. 
and it requires as well flexibility from you. Yeah? Actually, a lot of my uh, uh, former students, the alumni that are now in the field, uh, if I travel around the world and I go to the current projects, I meet them there. Yeah? So uh, um, I explained the example. I, I recently, well, last year, no, two, two years ago, I, I worked with a really big contractor in Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, Qatar, and Dubai. And I met my students consistently in those places. Yeah? Whereas before, they never worked there. They worked in other places. Yeah? So there's a culture, particularly for project manager, where you're expected to go with the projects. Yeah? And it's actually the hot topics. Yeah? So it's the uh, uh, hot projects. So uh, um, this, this requires a certain flexibility. It gives you as well a certain flexibility. Yeah? So work environments are normally not 9 to 5 anymore. You can structure your own work day. Yeah, so as a project manager, you too uh, will be able to uh, maybe go home between, I don't know, uh, um, 11 and 3 yeah, to do your own thing because often the project work is the after work as well of the performance. Yeah? So there are flexibilities that kind of bring empowerment to you yeah? So as an a, a employee, even as a project manager, but it creates as well constraints for you. Right? Your team members may use the same flexibility. Now, in the past, we were as well producing things, yeah? so this was like a product, an output focused, and now we are more into uh, creating meanings and brand identities, yeah? so uh, um, you too may actually become part uh, of, a, of a certain movement or identity. Yeah? And again, so th this was as well the notion very quick uh, um, from Fordism, so this was again the scientific management, right? to uh, post for the, uh, uh, Fordism, where we actually kind of look at additional topics like culture, like motives, and uh, um, as well identity, if you want. Yeah? Now, this led as well to a debate about whether the post Fordist organization is actually empowering or more controlling, because we, we had that already before, right? This means as well that you, as an employee, I expect to kind of engage with your personal development to create a portfolio of the right, uh, right roles to grow. Yeah? So if, if you uh, go with a professional body like the Association for Project Management and you want to be a fully chartered member, you will see you have to cover certain areas of what is perceived the project management identity. Yeah? So this is a new game. In the past, uh, actually, I, I'm still from a country like that. In Germany, we, we haven't got this, so we don't have professional bodies. It's still a government right, a yeah, state right, to give you professional accreditation. So, for example, when I st uh, uh, finished my degree in Germany, uh, which is now an MNG equivalent, yeah, uh, um, they actually gave me the title of a um, chartered engineer from the state. Yeah, you don't have to do anything else than studying, and that is your identity for your rest of your life. Yeah, you, you may still recognize that with uh, uh, jobs like a lawyer or medical doctor, right? There's still this identity that once you graduate, well, there is some practice, yeah, but it's, uh, uh, it's a different uh, um, type of identity. So the question was then as well, is this actually empowering or is it actually more controlling, right? Because if you have that identity, you may have a self-driven notion behind it, yeah? Now, this really led to uh, the disciplinary power, and this came from Michel Foucault. Actually, this is quite a heavy theorem, but in a nutshell, if uh, Michel Foucault's uh, uh, um, uh, view on power was uh, um, one that we kind of moved on from last week as not something that is uh, exercised between two people, but something that is inherently there in every relationship. Yeah, so uh, um, power is not imposed from above, uh, um, but it's widely dispersed in society, it's in our relationships, how we make sense, how we shape the uh, um, conversation. So my, my favorite example here in the UK is, is it better if you're real, so you, you have bought a property yeah, for your retirement, that's a good investment, you live in it as a, a benefit too, so you don't have to pay rent, yeah? and now the whole area increases in property value. Is this good or bad? What would you think? After you buy it or before you? Before you buy it? If it's after you buy it, then it's a good thing if it increases in property value? No? Yeah, so you, you tell me. So from an investment point, you, you have already used the right language, right? So from an investment point, if you buy it cheap, and then the investment uh, prices in your area actually rise, 
your neighbor house has suddenly uh, increased by something like 50%, yeah, this is really good for you. Because if you sell a similar property, you are likely to make the same gain, right? So, but, uh, um, so this is the investment perspective. How, how is it for you living in the house, actually? Is it as well good, or, or is it indifferent, or, or does it not matter, or is it bad? Did, did you have the experience, maybe? Have, have you? I, I don't know. I'm not sure if it's a good, if it's like, a, if it's a positive or not. Like, I just assume that it was probably a positive, you know, because, mm -hmm. but I, I suppose it just doesn't. Yeah. Well, so from an investment point, this is good, right? An investment point, yeah, yeah, of course it is. Yeah. But if, if you look at it, what, what really happens is you get the same space for more money, yeah? This is not an improvement of living. If you live in a place you want, uh, um, there, there are certain health criteria for living, right? You need a certain space ratio. So for me, it's really bad if the bed is the size of this table. Yeah, I hang everywhere out and, and have a very unpleasant night, right? So there's a spatial condition. This is where the health condition, so you want to have a certain room space. Arguably, big rooms are better. Yeah, arguably, I'm not sure. Yeah, you, you can decide for yourself. But by making the uh, room space more expensive, you actually decrease, arguably, the uh, living experience, right? Again, this is kind of coming from a different perspective. So using the space for living, it may be a different uh, uh, point. But again, we have already recognized a lot of you kind of could see the investment angle, but my angle is actually quite complicated. It's not that straightforward. But actually, if we travel back 40 years in time, and you speak uh, uh, maybe to your grandparents or to your parents and you ask, what are you looking for? They will tell you, we are looking for a spatial flat, uh, a spatial uh, place with like some natural light. If you're in a Mediterranean or tropical area, there then you will see they don't like too much sun. Whereas when we are in northern countries, yeah, we, we are like more sun, big windows, yeah, we, we, we think highly of it. Yeah? So there's a different association. Yeah? Now, this is, uh, um, so this is, uh, um, yeah, if, if you want, it's an interpretation power of what society agrees is actually good. This is basically the uh, power that Michel Foucault is talking about. We are jumping here on ideas that may not actually be beneficial for me. Yeah? So I, I may have my own property, but at the moment, I'm largely living in this space. So seeing it as an investment, uh, a good investment, and living in a very small, confined place, it's actually a crazy idea. Yeah? So I'm, I'm investing here in the future. This is compromising my living space at the moment. Yeah? OK, but again, so the ideas were actually uh, imposed, and they're held up through interaction between society, right? us talking about it. I, I was very convinced with your investment plea. Yeah? So I, I was like, yeah, yeah, you have a point. So in a way, this is how strong the power actually is. It's uh, um, exercise, and uh, um, power is not viewed as repressive, but as productive. So by repeating it, and kind of keeping the agenda going, or even disagreeing, like why, why would it be negative, yeah, you, you actually shape a certain idea of it. Yeah? And uh, well, this is kind of the notion, uh, power is disciplinary, so it creates normal uh, uh, subjects, i.e. people, through discourses and practices. So we agree uh, um, in a certain community, in our team, for example, on what is right and wrong. Yeah, what, what is the norm? Uh, did, did you have Tupman with uh, um, Alan Osborne and Michelle? Tupman, storming, norming, yeah. performing, yeah. adjuncting. Well, this is more new. Yeah, so he didn't believe in adjuncting, but he, he was up for the first two uh, uh, four stages. Yeah, and, and what, what was that about? Did you remember? Yeah, team building, exactly. And what, what, what is so critical? Why, why is it, uh, um, so why, why uh, do we need this process? Do we need it, or is it like a description? Yeah, we need it, but it's inherent in actually coming together, yeah? So you're, you're spot on. So it's kind of a description of what will happen. This comes actually from Michel Foucault. Yeah, Tuckman just understood this and kind of came up with this model, so it actually interlinks, yeah? And uh, you, you can see, how, how does it work? Can we actually be storming? What, what was storming again in Tukman? Do you remember that? Was storming like we, we go all windsurfing or kitesurfing or something like that? No. 
process for you that conflict? Yeah. So it's a process of conflict, and then what 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 happens with the conflict? You're spot on, yeah? So this is individuals kind of negotiating, arguably, what the norm is of your team behavior, right? So you notice like, hey, why are you doing this this way? This is not really working for me. I, I prefer it this way. Yeah? And then you have kind of recognized a very settled conflict that you try to negotiate it, hopefully constructive. Yeah, but it, it can literally lead to a lack of collaboration. So in Tuchman's idea, it's really that you have to kind of solve the storming to arrive at the norming, right? So where, where you again arrive at a, a harmony element before you can actually perform, yeah? Now this, this is quite idealized, but uh, uh, this, this is a little bit uh, um, what uh, uh, Michel Foucault kind of described as a process. Yeah, so he kind of establishes, you're negotiating here what is actually normal. Yeah? So in a team we have to do that potentially every time new Particularly if we have a very diverse team. Yeah? If, if you have worked on very different projects to me, yeah, I, I've worked, I don't know, in very standardized settings maybe. Uh, uh, should we uh, take some classical ones? So for example, in the military, we have very clear rule descriptions. And although we have uh, challenging uh, environments, uh, very different environments, I'm probably quite used to a normal behavior. Yeah? So I, I will be very distressed if you are not like illustrating kind of the hierarchy uh, notion. So if you have worked in a science team or a research and development team, you do the opposite. You are looking for experts, right? You're not interested who, who is the boss. You want to have the right information. Yeah? So, uh, um, so you have a very different behavior with communicating and kind of listening to people's information and input and valuing it, right? So this, this would be actually quite discerning for two individuals in the same team. And that, that is literally what, what Michel Foucault discovered and then kind of argued. We have it now at the society level. Yeah? This, this was new. Yeah? Now here, here is where the modern, uh, well, he actually uh, discussed this uh, co controversial uh, topic. Yeah, by the way, this is not very romantic. Uh, sex, sexuality created in Victorian areas. So uh, um, it's, it's not uh, erotic or anything like this. So just be aware. Yeah? It's actually uh, a sociology of knowledge. The Victorians kind of figured out that you can actually uh, um, create a norm of couples coming together. Yeah? If you're interested in this area, uh, um, there is a fellow, uh, um, what is his name? It's, uh, so his family name is De Botton. This is why I remember this. He's a philosopher. And he actually says uh, uh, even that sexuality was destroyed by the Victorians. Yeah, but it's an entire different notion. So they, they basically started talking about sexuality at the institutional level. So the state said, actually, you should be married before you have uh, um, sexual relations. Yeah? Before, this was not necessarily the case. So this is kind of a concept from 1750 to 1840. And Michel Foucault showed that by framing this that way, he changed actually the relationship of people. Now this is a pretty new uh, uh, concept. If you look at this, this was actually an act of talking about it, which was very private to people. People were like, what, why, why, why where is this coming from? So it's only associated with uh, monotisms like the church. You, you shouldn't uh, have, uh, um, I think that they don't want you to have uh, sexual relations with the neighbors. But the point is here that the Victorians kind of embrace this as a concept that really kind of separated the normal from the deviant. They recognize as well things that you, you shouldn't have uh, um, uh, uh, sexuality with other people, and it depends on your gender. So there were a lot of elements that they actually came up with. But it's a fascinating concept where you can really see it suddenly changing the perception of, of whole societies. Yeah? Now, Foucault provides as well insightful conception on relationships among discourse, power, identity, and organizations. So as well, if, if, you, uh, um, if you have a management uh, um, discourse, uh, uh, a classical one, what, what is a good attribute? How do you recognize a good worker in your team? Well, what would you say? So if, if you're looking at your team, well, what is a good indicator? Takes leadership. Take, takes leadership? 
Yeah, good communication. So this is already very proactive. I, I like the suggestions, yeah? So maybe a natural leader in terms of uh, um, subject allocation, yeah, or, or good communicator. But in, in a work organization, what, what about hard working? Is this good? He's a hard worker. But what does that actually mean, hard worker? What, what do you think? Someone tries to their full potential, you know? Yeah. So commitment is normally one, and you, you can see as well uh, physically that they are trying, yeah? Now, is this uh, um, a discourse that is uh, kind of inherently management oriented, or is this employee um, uh, or team member oriented? What do you think? What would you say this to your friends? I'm really hard working. Okay, you smile. Why, why, why is that uh, funny? So, uh, I don't know. It's the strangest conversation that you would have with friends, yeah. right? Like, hello, I'm your friend, and I'm very hard working. You're welcome. Yeah, and it's, uh, everybody's like, well, what's going on? Yeah, this is really strange. So the, the irony is uh, um, you notice when you actually do the duality, yeah, you reverse the logic, like that is a identity. It's branded into our society. Yeah, hard working is seen as something good, but only for work organization makes that sense. Yeah? So think about it. As an employee, is he maybe working too hard? Have you ever considered that? Yeah? So it's really weird when I say this now. Like, oh, maybe he's working too hard. This is when you're interested in somebody's well-being, yeah? or you, you want to have a relaxed time and not a robot next to you. I, I hope this hasn't happened to you yet. But I, I have colleagues, particularly in academia, we have this a lot. We, we meet, like socializing, have a lovely coffee together, and they're straight away again in their research literature. Oh, I've read recently this paper, and you're like, no, no, we, we are just friends, we are just chatting. Come on, stop, stop working. Yeah? And, and they can't switch off because they're very hard working. Yeah? Arguably, the psychologist will maybe tell you, like, oh, okay, work-life balance, not so clearly cut with him. Yeah, so there, there's even a, a stage where it becomes concerning. Yeah, and this is a, a part of discourse. Yeah? So hard working is something that is probably idealized in a lot of work societies, but uh, um, the reverse is actually as well true. Yeah? So sometimes working too hard can be as, as well negative, but it's not a view either. Now, his uh, work has been as well extensively used in management study to examine how the post fordist organization engages in forms of control. So we had a lot of uh, problematizations uh, with uh, Michel Foucault. So he showed actually that management had a huge influence. Do you know the watchtower idea? The idea that you're always being watched. Is this a concern? Is that good or bad? What about Watchtower? So actually, so th this example that I'm naming comes actually from a prison study. So they noticed that uh, um, both prisoners and actually the prison guards were quite exhausted by physically being there as a guard. So the, the guards would look away, and then the prisoners would do naughty things, or perceived naughty things. Yeah, so it was a game, basically, between trying to slip the control of the guards and still living their individuality or, or their rebellion against the guards. Now, what they did realize is there are two problems here. First of all, the, both uh, um, the prisoner and the guard can see each other. So they basically built a watchtower. This is an invention from uh, 1720 and was long there before uh, from castles. So you can go a long time back in history. And as a psychology phenomena, they realized that the uh, prisoners were actually doing less naughty things because they couldn't see if the guards were actually watching them because they were behind kind of the tower shutter. So they couldn't actually see where their eyes were pointing. Yeah? And that, that was perceived as a huge device, but they recognized something else. The prisoner population became incredibly stressed. Yeah? So for them, that was a huge effect. And we, we still use that, actually. So in the work environment, Arguably, it's okay that your employer captures your emails and your communication devices, right? Is it okay if your employer reads the emails? How, how would you feel about this? First of all, let, let's uh, first question first. Would it be okay for you as a project manager to read all the emails from your teams, even the ones that are not addressed to you? Right, there are some emails as a project manager, of course. You will be copied in, or, or there, there will be SharePoint. This is fine, right? But what about the communication from the other team members? 
Is it okay to read the emails or have access to them? I suppose like in work emails, you know, I'd say it's unethical to do, mm. but if the manager felt like he had a reason to read the work emails, I suppose he's, a, he's got a right to because he's the manager, and he probably shouldn't really, you know. Okay, so two, two points here. First, you have an ethical concern, but then you say, but, uh, um, and, and you kind of give this, uh, um, what, why do, so what, what legitimizes the manager's uh, um, ability to look into this? He could have a reason, he could feel like he has a reason to do it, you know, because at the end of the day, he's managing those people. And, uh, so you, you see it as a responsibility, yeah? Yeah. So yeah. he is as well responsible and looks after the team members. So therefore, he may has to uh, um, make a decision that kind of... Uh, um, it's not really right for him to do it, but like, he can, I mean, it's like, he, he's, he has, he probably has, a, he can, he can like, say that he has a right to do it, you know, if he, if he felt like he needed to read their emails. Yeah, so from an organization point, actually in most contracts, this is granted to management. Yeah, so to, to have a look in your... Uh, um, Communications, yeah. Even listen to your phone if it's very sophisticated uh, company. But uh, um, purely from an ethical point, yeah, we would actually say this is a bad idea, right? Uh, other perspectives. So there, there was a claim of responsibility. So the manager is responsible. Therefore, there may be a, a, a legitimacy to look into the emails, yeah, or communications. Is it okay? We had responsibility, ethical, uh, ethical dilemma on the other side. How, how would you feel as a team member if you find that out? So you, you have written like uh, um, at the end of the day to your uh, team member, hey, fancy having a quick coffee after work? And then your manager is like, this is inappropriate. This person was still working, you distracted them, they didn't, didn't finish their task. You should stop encouraging them to finish early. Yeah? Yeah, like you wouldn't be happy at all, really. Yeah, I suppose. Your manager was wanted to read your emails, like. Yeah, but why, why not? It's like, it's like an invasion of privacy. Yes. So th this is normally the wake up. Uh, uh, called literally on, on uh, Michel Foucault's idea of the watchtower. This is often when you become aware. Yeah? Now the tools are available now for you as a project manager. You can do that. Yeah. Actually it's worse if, if I show you the, the tools that are actually ICT wise uh, uh, possible. So we, you can even analyze metadata from certain servers. So you can even look at their Google history so if they use any of the services, all the providers like Google, LinkedIn, they give you full access to the metadata data of computer identities. Yeah, this is very controversial. Yeah, but uh, uh, it's it's possible. Yeah, but if you do this, you you break probably trust or, or uh, maybe feel deceived yeah, from your manager. You, you feel that you're not honest anymore, right? And it has a huge impact. So people then become very cautious, right? So they don't use emails anymore, they just speak uh, when, when music is running in the background yeah, or something like that. Yeah, so this is already like, uh, uh, I don't know if you've seen any spy movies, yeah, this is in the uh, claustrophobia where you're on the other side. Yeah, so where you think like, oh, I'm being watched all the time. Yeah, and it gets really freaky potentially. Yeah. So those are the extremes, but uh, um, as a settled force we always have this nowadays. Yeah, and we, we have actually enabled communication or ICT infrastructure that allows us to do so on a huge scale, right? Okay, so this has been, uh, um, been kind of shown in the uh, studies, and actually, to be fair, there, there's a lot of case studies in the book chapter on this, yeah? So I, I want to cover this where one with you later, but uh, um, yeah, this is where this was coming from. Now, with this, we have as well post fordist organizational forms uh, um, as a response to transformations in economic and political climate of industrial nations. Well, what, what was again for this? What, what did this mean? What were the features? Did you remember roughly? Yeah, this is always bad. This is like an academic book, so you can see where the history comes from. But of course, they use as well their own uh, terminology. So, for this was what again? What did it say? Well, where, where did Fordist come from? What, what type of company was it? 
It's actually in the name, right? It's a car manufacturer, Ford, right? So it was the notion of bringing people into an industry complex, right? And having a look at productivity with different motors, right? And this followed then with the scientific management. This is where we have the timing from, right, in projects. So that we actually time activity and sequence them in terms of critical uh, progression, right? Or, or performance of the overall task, yeah? Okay, now, this, this was kind of surprising that we actually came to this point. But uh, um, the political climate and the industrial nations, well, what happened to industrial nations? Are we still producing in industrial nations? N name me maybe five industrial nations. Who is actually a manufacturing country? Germany. Yes, yeah. so in, in Germany, we, we still believe this a lot, yeah? So manufacturing. Yeah. Other countries? China. Yeah, China, you're, you're spot on. Other ones? Japan. Japan, South Korea, yeah? But then it gets tricky. India tries to be manufacturing power at the moment. They're still on the brink. So if you look at the, they're, they're a very big country, so they're manufacturing a lot. But if you look at it, they have manufacturing, and then it kind of slowed down, and now they are kind of picking up again, yeah? So, but if, if you look at the other countries, is UK a manufacturing country? No. Yeah? And they still have manufacturing in pockets, but it actually moved on. Yeah, so we, we kind of uh, um, changed the organizational forms from not having the industry here, but here's still a lot of design and branding, right? Th this is actually really surprising, yeah? So for Germans, we, so uh, I play here absolute stereotypes now, yeah? But in, in Germany, we, we don't understand the concept of brand. Yeah? It's, it's like, what, it's the same clothes. If the sticker is there or not, we don't care. Yeah, so uh, this was my German accent there. The, 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 Impression. Uh, uh, they, uh, um, so the point is, whereas in the UK you are the opposite, right? So uh, um, in the UK it's like, what? This is not Dolce and Gabbana. Why would I wear this? Yeah, this is not for me. Yeah. So uh, um, so there's a brand identity. Yeah, I play here uh, um, uh, uh, Devil's Advocate. But the point is, if you look at the supply chain, it's manufactured. If it's close, most likely uh, um, not here. Yeah. So it's probably manufactured in India, China, you name it. Yeah. Actually, if you look at China, they have as well outsourced, so it's now happening in Angola and Botswana, but again, same game. Yeah? So, uh, um, and if you look at the products, it's all manufactured there. They, they get the kind of uh, wonderful um, uh, material, the, the fabric, you name it, yeah? and they, they produce it. But still, people buy the brand, which then has, of course, an overhead. Now, this is actually quite surprising. But this is basically the post Fordist notion. Yeah? So we have new forms. It's so where you as a project manager, if you work with a particular brand of project managers, then your project management may add insecurity to the overall project, although you are just doing project management. Yeah? So if you run around with something like the Atkins Group, for example, then the investors will get a better risk rating, actually, on their investment. This, this means so that they have done a lot of uh, projects in the past, yeah? so they are very good in uh, project management, so they deserve this. But the same with the clothes. Yeah? If you buy, let's go a little bit wilder, if you go with uh, Benetton, it's Italian, right? So Benetton has as well this ethical supply chain, but they still manufacture in all the traditional manufacturing places. They basically just get a slightly higher price because they, they have an ethical supply chain. But this is very surprising, right? What, what does say that the other manufacturers don't have by accident as well an ethical supply chain? Yeah? So there, there's a big question actually behind it. But this is where this is coming from. Yeah? So with this you have as well a product of more uh, volatile and competitive economic environment and uh, um, slow to change bureaucratic form no longer viewed as functional. This had as well to do with uh, everything that was kind of paper burdensome or, or where there was a lot of regulation. You put this in another nation, right? As a manufacturer, as a project team, this was the whole point, right? So as well, uh, um, at the moment, yeah, the, the, uh, this is slightly controversial. Uh, if, if you have a product, if you want to uh, um, design your own car, yeah, and uh, um, you, you want to sell it to Germany where everybody likes to drive around with a car, yeah? Then the key is that you maybe pre-assemble all the parts in Germany yeah, because they're quite good in this, but then you, you actually assemble it here in the UK. Then you get taxed here, right? So 
So then you can actually get lower tax and you can still sell it for the good price to Germany. Yeah, so this is basically creating, uh, well, you, you basically avoid the bureaucratic and, and maybe tax burden that is associated with the regulations in Germany. Yeah? Now this was also a response, uh, an increased power of uh, shareholders and need to uh, um, short-term profits. So um, this was as well kind of part of that notion of uh, um, yeah, generating surplus value. And with uh, post uh, um companies, we could do so. So the high value, if, if you have a company, you're very successful in the design and the manufacturing, you're kind of competing with other companies, then you may as well outsource the uh, manufacturing. That was the idea. Yeah? So you only keep the high value adding activities. Yeah? A lot of project uh, uh, organizations came actually into being that way. Yeah? If you look at the big consultancies, in construction, they were complete construction organizations. If you look at the old Balfabiti here in the UK, they had the tradesmen, uh, um, they, they had the whole construction organization employed. And they did exactly that. They kind of said like, okay, construction teams, why don't you start your own company and then compete with the other companies? This is effectively what they did. Yeah? And that, that was of course so that uh, um, the units that create increased value would be even more profitable and you wouldn't have the burden or risk or, or responsibility for the other activities. Yeah? Now, uh, with this, we, we have discussed that already. So for this organization was highly bureaucratic structure and we, we understood as well where we came there. This was coming from the kind of uh, autocratic style yeah, where you are a manager by default because of your family or something like that uh, to actually thinking of meaningful ways of having uh, um, decisions actually functionally allocated so bureaucratic structure was one feature then uh, um, differentiated labor process so you had here kind of trades and skills apprentices that led to uh, being uh, somebody that is skilled then you had large economics of scale we, we still have that right actually arguably with the globalization even more so then we had the standardization of products so a lot of our standards that we have around with a light bulb or, or uh, um, screw size or things like this, this was actually kind of standardized by certain companies at the time, right? They wanted to have a trade advantage. So by having a standard, you are basically prioritizing your product, right? So this was the idea. Then uh, stable lifetime uh, employment. So, uh, uh, and this is still true in a lot of manufacturing companies, right? Uh, countries. So if you are in Germany, you go to a manufacturer they employ you for life, so there's no term contract. Yeah, they've played around with that, but they can't do this uh, beyond their kind of core employment. So maybe for additional surplus uh, um, manufacturing capacity, you can play around with term contracts, and it's very, very bad for kind of the commitment of the employees. Yeah, the, the biggest joke, but so actually this is a side story. Yeah, uh, um, my, my dad uh, uh, used to be an investment uh, banker, let's uh, keep it simple. He worked with automotive, and uh, there was a wonderful case of Mercedes. So Mercedes kind of outsourced the design. They were like, oh, the Brits, they are so much better. And what they did is, before Mercedes had everything in the house. Yeah? So they had uh, everything, design, manufacturing, even the tradespeople that kind of assemble the car or, or do the uh, uh, production of the parts. Yeah? But then they kind of outsourced it. And the designers were like, OK, uh, um, we, we don't really like Mercedes anymore. Yeah? Uh, um, you, you kind of fire us. And they went to China and they started a new, uh, with the supply chain of China, they said like, hey, how about a joint venture and we design our own car? They did this and it's now one of the most successful cars. Yeah, so there was a certain uh, uh, worry for a lot of companies uh, to not have a st uh, stable lifetime employment because this is why employers actually stay with them. Yeah, so if, if you don't have that, you're kind of competing as well as an employer for your employees particularly if you have very skilled workers. Yeah? So as well for you as a project manager, you're on the other side. Yeah? As a project manager, you are highly desirable. Once you have a skill set, if they don't pay enough, then there's a possibility for you to go to another company. Yeah? You play actually an edging role. Yeah? So you have actually quite a, a um, thorough skill set. And, and likewise, you, you can negotiate as well within your company better roles or, or a, a better pay. Yeah? So the, the lifetime employment, is still a hot topic in Japan. They, 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 don't, they, they know the same problem that the Germans had there. 
the, the flexible working is not a good idea for those manufacturing uh, countries because they have invested a lot in kind of developing their designs, their kind of technologies, yeah? and this is highly sought after by all the competitors. Yeah? So it's, it's of course a no-brainer. And in South Korea, it's actually the same if you look at it. Yeah? So they are uh, um, in all the big manufacturing countries, they kind of have fully been arguably developed yeah, as you, you will see, they hold really on to their employees, so they don't want flexibility there. And then you have as well the uh, um, transfer of Fordist principles to a wider society. So we, we actually talked about this already. So people are actually quite, uh, um, they are quite structured oriented. Yeah? So uh, people like to have order, yeah? uh, um, which, which is quite interesting. Now here come as, uh, here are as well our projects, kind of from the 1960s. So here you have kind of the post fordist uh, uh, or post-modern organization uh, and post fordism So here the features are more flexible organizational structures, projects, right? So you may be, uh, um, uh, you, you have a small hierarchy in your team, you may be you the, the authority in your team, yeah? and you, you may have subordinates as a team, or you, you may have like something, does anybody know the star structure, like a star? So you are the central point as a project manager for decision making and reporting, yeah? but you actually embrace the specialisms. So you have team members that are experts or specialists, so you embrace them respectively and you know, make sure that when it comes to conflict and it's based on their topic area, that they have the final say on information input so that your overall uh, um, product or service that you're providing is actually going according to expertise rather than just pure decision making, right? But here we have a very different format, right? This is not our old hierarchy anymore, yeah? Now this is as well a de-differentiated labor process. So this means we, we have no longer kind of these traditional roles of you, you become a trainee or an apprenticeship and then you uh, become kind of a worker or tradesman or something like this and then you become a master or something like this. And we have actually changed it. Now you have kind of competence area, you become competent, and uh, um, the only hierarchy that you may have is first you train on new, uh, uh, new skills or you are educated in new skills, then you perform them, and then you are supervising somebody else to learn them, right? So it's a circular notion actually. We have changed here really uh, um, substantially how we are actually acquiring knowledge and skills, right? Then you have as well limited production runs and niche markets. Yeah, so uh, um, in projects, potentially none. Yeah? If you prototype or, or you have like an initial proof of concept, yeah, this may be for feasibility in some uh, product industries, uh, um, that, that's normally it, right? To project management, we, we don't talk so much about uh, um, uh, uh, production runs, right? H have you had a production run before in a project? I mean, here, the assessment we do, right? We have our peer review. So this is a first production run, right? And then you have a reproduction uh, uh, run when, when you're submitting the final draft, right? Again, this may be not viewed by you, like that, but uh, um, well, what is a production run? Well, what do you think means that? Uh, or what, what is the meaning of that? Who, who viewed the rowing video, the amazing video from last week? Has anybody seen that? Oh, this is heartbreak. Yeah, but uh, anyway, the, uh, um, the, the big rowing race is coming, yeah, so maybe, maybe then it will be more relevant. Uh, um, but uh, so what, what, what could that be? Uh, um, a production run, or, or what, what is the bonus of that? So if, if we do something with our team, what's the benefit for the team of having a production run? What, what do you think? Or maybe what's the benefit for you as a manager? Yeah, if you're a project manager, uh, you, you could look at it from both ways, right? So uh, um, first of all, we have the project manager level, right? And then we have our team. So well, what's the bonus uh, of having a, a production run? Any guesses? I guess, like, is, is it like a prototype maybe that yeah. is constantly being produced so it's cost saving, time efficient, you know? 
you, you have already gone a step further. You're spot on, yeah? So uh, um, your production run normally shows you of how to do the product or service that you're producing, right? And uh, um, having production runs, you can optimize it exactly on what you have said. You can see how you can make it cheaper, how you can maybe exchange what you have done, but you have to have a circular notion here, yeah? Now we have said as well in uh, projects, if you buy kind of subsystems, right? We, we had the prototype as such a thing. So particular in our aerospace, we do this a lot. Actually we prototype all uh, subsystems, arrays and, and whatever you have in, in your product uh, uh, before, which means you, you come to a completion of a part of your overall product, right? And you test it against its use. Yeah, sometimes it's for durability, that we had the notion of quality, right? I hope you remember with the, uh, I think, uh, um, yeah, with the, the nine uh, principles of quality or, or seven uh, um, design features. Uh, but uh, again, uh, if you don't remember, have a look at the slides. So this was literally the idea. Yeah, with a, a production run, you could actually refine, you could optimize your production, you could refine your product as well, you could look at how it's uh, um, assemblable, if it works as a system together, Right, so there, there may be parts that work fine together, but then the performance fall apart there. Yeah? So th this is literally what you could spot here. Now with projects, we have changed this game, right? We have limited production runs. So you have a one-off, this is very tough. This is why projects are as well extremely stressful as a performance uh, uh, piece, right? But it allows us to be as well more niche, so we don't have to have a manufacturing line set up. Right, uh, and if we do, then uh, um, it's normally bespoke, so we have a certain flexibility, and, and that allows as well the uh, refinement actually of different products. So we have niche markets, yeah. and niche markets become mass markets if you want. Now, another element actually of the postmodern organization, and we had that already uh, um, in the second uh, or first lecture, really, was the commodification of life. So products as lifestyles, but what, what is that? Communication of life. Can, can somebody help me with that? What, what do we mean by that? What, what is a commodity? It's again uh, old school language yeah, uh, uh, from the concepts, but what, what is a commodity? Is it a brand? Yeah. Commodity can be a product or, or, or service. Yeah, so you're quite right. It's a, a product with a brand. Yeah. So what is commodification of life? That's quite harsh, right? Or product as a lifestyle, no? But what can that mean? Okay, let, let's have a look at an example. Has anybody heard of Red Bull? What, what does Red Bull do? Gives you wings. Okay, so <laughs> okay. Here, here you have already jumped back to our uh, ideas, yeah. But uh, yeah, so it gives you wings. This is a uh, kind of advert. Coffee, like you know, get energy off it. So what, what, what do they do? It keeps you alert, you know, wakes you up. Okay, so you look already at the effects, right? But uh, it's an energy drink, right? So, and you're quite right. So then they have some additives that uh, kind of uh, uh, make you physically awake again, I guess, yeah? And uh, um, what, what, what is that product about? So you, it gives you wings, yeah? So you have already actually pointed out here uh, uh, what they want to provide you with. So what, what, what do they stand for? Is Red Bull the uh, uh, sophisticated drink that I, as an academic, should drink every morning before coming to work? No, I, I like that you're like, no. <laughs> <laughs> so wh why, why not? What, what <laughs> what's the association? Uh, it's unhealthy, not very good for you. Okay, oh, so you, you're already critical of the product, no, yeah? So okay, I, yeah, yeah. No, yeah? Well, no, there's obviously the benefits, and no, no, so this is uh, fine, yeah, so uh, um, it's associated as not being so healthy, but wh what about the product? Well, what is it associated with? Or, or let's play the game. I if you picture a Red Bull in person, what does he or she look like? What, what does he, she do or, or he do? This is a weird question, right? So this is surreal in the first place, what I'm asking. 
but if Red Bull would be a person, what would he or she look like? And what would she or he do? I take guesses. And then we will probably come to an agreement. It's shocking, yeah? That that actually works. So it's a surreal question, yeah? So that there is no one person, but what, what, what does Red Bull stand for for you in your mind? Okay, let, let, let's think a little bit about it. Is uh, Red Bull uh, a person that, that is, uh, um, uh, like me, a, a person of convenience, you can see, uh, um, probably a, a cake too many or so? Or is a person more sporty? Or, or is, is a person younger or, or more old? Or, or what, what do you see? I see like, like a student, probably, maybe, you know? A student. Uh, and a and, uh, student here defined by uh, age, uh, where, where would you place a student? Uh, oh, sorry, yeah, age so wise, like. Younger, younger or older or? Uh, younger. Younger? Yeah. Okay. And, and uh, uh, a person of leisure? Or, or uh, um, more a, a sports person? Or, or more a critical reader, you know, a lot in the library? and yeah. Or, or theatre? Or someone, someone more in the library, yeah. Probably. Someone in the library? Okay, yeah. yeah. Sports as well, like. Sport, sport, yeah? Yeah. What, what sports? Yeah, physical. Yeah, yeah well, what, what do you have in mind? Is that the classical golf player or? Yeah, probably not something high endurance, like, you know, probably like, I don't know, you say motocross or something? Yeah, okay, motocross, yeah, good example. Yeah. Uh, other uh, associations? Red Bull? Actually, do, do we all know Red Bull? Yeah, okay. Red Bull? Yeah? So we have motocross, Any, anything else that comes to mind? Oh, you didn't see the space dive, did you? The kind of, no? The skydiver that, that came from the, from space back, no? Okay, so somebody notes, yeah? Other people look, okay, yeah. Okay. I remember now, yeah. Yeah. It was a couple years ago. Yeah, yeah, two, yeah. two, two or three years ago, yeah. 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 So normally, uh, um, lifestyle Red Bull is associated with extreme sports. I, I was actually fascinated with the library. So this gives me probably a hidden insight to what you have been observing here in our library. Yeah, yeah but that's, <laughs> so that, that's maybe a new notion. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's normally associated with extreme uh, sports, yeah, giving you wings, like succumbing your natural limits. Yeah, and it's normally associated either with a young uh, woman or, or young man that uh, um, physically is extremely uh, um, fit and uh, uh, outgoing. Doesn't subscribe to my cake and coffee culture so much, yeah. so, uh, which is quite interesting. Now, you can play with as well with other products. Uh, um, yeah, so actually you can do that with most products, yeah, because they are now products of lifestyle, yeah. So it's the same, like what, what is the mode of transport if you have an a Apple Mac? How do you go to work? Do you walk? Do you cycle? Do you drive? Do you take the public transport? Do you have a helicopter or a plane that brings you to work? What, what, what do you associate with Apple? I, let, let's keep it simple. The iPhone, the iPhone, the newest iPhone. If you have that, how, how do you commute to work or, or university? Walk. Yeah. Yeah, that's the right answer. So, uh, um, so it's either walking or cycling. Yeah. But if, if you come with your sports car, then you, you are already blending. This is not the authentic I, iPhone uh, lifestyle. Yeah. But it, it's true. Yeah. So those brands build actually on an identity that is tailored around certain images, which is really strange. So it, it forms us, so if you go to the clothes store, you, you, you can do that maybe, uh, try it with any brand here, Phoenix or, or H&M or something like that, and ask them like, what, what would be fashionable clothes? And just pull your mobile out or something like that, and you will see that the uh, sales uh, um, person will probably correspond to that. And it will take you to a certain area and say like, oh, you should try those jeans, they're very trendy. Yeah. Okay, I've probably given you bad brands, but uh, um, the, the point is, it, it's, a, it's a big thing. Yeah? So there, there's a whole notion of identity behind it. Yeah? 
And this means as well, products are not just advertised to you to assess for yourself if they are useful or not. And so as a project manager, we want the opposite, right? We want to know, do we need this equipment or this machine? What can the machine or equipment do? And then when they say, like, oh, but it's a, it's a Tesla crane or it's a Tesla bore machine, which uh, is still a prototype, then you are like, okay, this is very risky. Goodbye, I'm not interested there. Yeah? It's not like, oh, wow, Tesla, let's put the brand on. Yeah? So we, we have actually different to this. So there's a conflict on, on, on basically the organizations for. Yeah, so it, it's quite interesting that we don't do the same when we're actually kind of going out in the world and, and, uh, and kind of uh, uh, live. Yeah. Now, increasingly, this means as well unstable employment. But keep in mind, so this is maybe a little bit uh, uh, um, old traditions from Karl Marx, who, who still idealized the notion that you, you go into employment, you stay there as an organization and live in your community as such. Yeah, so uh, um, increasing unstable employment works both ways. Yeah, so employers compete for you to stay with them against other employers and vice versa. Your workplace may actually just organize now uh, uh, employment contracts and projects. Yeah? So depending on uh, um, your uh, qualifications and previous work, they may say like, yeah, we want to keep you for these five projects. We can see this is exactly your remit. And they give you like something like a 10 year contract. This is already long. Normally, it's more likely to be a three-year contract. So even even I had that already uh, ten oh, no, no, eleven years ago. Yeah, in PepsiCo, I was full-time employee, but I was actually internally competing for my contracts to kind of justify my pay. Yeah. So in my company, I, I would see a whole list of tailored jobs for me, and they would say, like, "Hey, Robert, don't you want to be a project manager in Russia? We have a new job near uh, Saint Petersburg." Yeah, and that that was. That looked good on the portfolio, but I wasn't so interested in it. Yeah? So I went instead with a project management job in the, uh, well, actually in Western Cape, in, in Hilton instead. Yeah? But you, you basically uh, have your projects, and when the projects come to an end, you keep an eye on the posts that you have actually available. Yeah? And this is as well how I had my natural kind of progression. So I applied actually suddenly for jobs that were slightly beyond my pay scale. So this was how I got actually a pay increase. Yeah? So this is more and more common. So we actually kind of work in a portfolio of work, and it's up to you to kind of uh, engage with this. But again, employers try to keep you as well. So it's there, they, they need the people. Uh, it doesn't work without it. Now, this is as well particularly terrifying. If you have a huge turnover in your project team, this creates completely different dynamics. Right? So you, you have as well here lack of commitment potentially from your team members if they know that they are starting a new job in one month and they are probably already mentally preparing and already mentally disconnecting from a current work environment. Yeah, so there are a lot of issues that actually come with that. And then uh, the last one, blurring of work-home distinction. What, what is that? Work-home distinction? Well, we had that before, right? First session. Uh, um, that does it, is it good to work from home? So is it good or, or bad for our for our project organization, for example, or our company? Probably, like, not, no. good. not good because you know you need it. You're not communicating with you know your colleagues and stuff, really. Or it? Yeah, uh, arguably it works uh, both ways. Yeah, so uh, uh, physically you're not there, so quick questions become at least a phone call or chat, right? So it's not as easy to interact directly. And uh, uh, what, what is the other problem? You're so if you're at home and, and somebody wants to talk to you? Yeah. Like, there's no communication barrier, really, you know? Yes. Yeah. Especially by, like, prompt and stuff, you need to be in, like, industry like that. Um, you've got to be on hand all the time, like, mm. and, like, reporting to your manager and things like that. So that yeah, it, it or works. Your, or your colleagues, sorry, you know, yeah. if you are the manager. Yeah, spot on. Yeah, so it works both ways. You have as well no privacy at home anymore. Yeah? And it may interfere with your family life, with your friend's life. So there, there are certain uh, um, issues with it, but it's, it's a commonality nowadays. Yeah? So you too, or, or actually I, I hear as well at the university, we have this now since 10 years, that we have flexible working. Yeah? It's kind of inherent uh, in, in our work. 
Now with this, you have er uh, earliest research on uh, work teams focused as well on coal miners' uh, effects of new technologies on work. So, uh, and by the way, the teamwork was seen here as a technology, yeah? so don't uh, um, uh, uh, mistake this. And then they had the, uh, um, yeah, Tris shows how workers and teams engaged in responsible autonomy, the system destroyed by introduction of technology. So uh, um, here, responsible autonomy was if you are counted against as a team, as a project team, you want to do well, right? Because if your team now performs in a certain way, and uh, um, this is not satisfying. It's not an individual doing the work anymore. It's your whole team being responsible for it. So it has a self-enforcing mechanism. Uh, if you look actually at the uh, case study from Trees that he describes, it's actually quite grim. Yeah, so there are some workers that really try to be the high-performing team to get extra pay, but it's really constraining some of the team members that can't really do that. Yeah? So it had a certain impact on, on uh, uh, individuals, and it really changed it. Now, as a working definition, uh, um, this came out kind of from Cohen and Bailey. A team is a collection of individuals who are independent in their task, who share responsibility for the outcomes, who see themselves and who are seen by others as an intact social entity. So, you know, it's a team, right? It's a project team. So it's one unit, yeah? Uh, embedded in one or more large social systems. So again, a project team may be part of a delivery mechanism for your product, right, or, or for your change uh, um, management. And uh, that, that was actually a new way of looking at organizing. Yeah, this is actually quite unique. Now here the uh, main factors relating to the performance of the teams was task design. So how does the com uh, composition and complexity of task affect team performance? And uh, um, what, what do you think? Uh, well, what is better, task design or role design? Or well, what, what would you be more comfortable with? So as a project manager, to kind of uh, be able to say like, okay, my project management role is here to look after the communication. I facilitate communication. I control the quality processes that are in place for the product. Would it be better to define it as a role or a role for the project? Or is it okay to just say, okay, today you have to kind of bring the team members together, introduce them to each other, and make sure that they start developing a design? Or what is better? Role or task design? What, what do you say? Role. Yeah, why? Why would you prefer that? Um, it's just you're, you're being involved, embedded, and everyone's like, you know, decision making, things like that. Yeah. It's just better, like it's where you're working more as like a team, you're involved more or something, if that makes sense. It's just a guess over it. Yeah. Yeah, so you, you have a point. So you, you have already recognized with the role design, right? You, you have like kind of a perspective that you can use to actually look through the project life cycle yeah? or the product design, what, whatever it is. Whereas when you have task design, you turn up, right? You, you turn up to your task and uh, you say, okay, what, what is my task today, right? So then you, you go as well, respectively, home like this, yeah? Like, I've achieved my task, so this is it for today, right? So there, there's as well lightness about it, but it, it uh, creates as well this connection. So your team members may not look out what comes next, right? They just perform their task, not even thinking about what they have to do tomorrow, maybe with that task, right? It's more, it's probably better, like, employee motivation as well, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, so you, you're quite right. So uh, um, there's quite a different element of identity, right? If you're just doing tasks, then what's the point? Uh, um, if you stop tomorrow and you do another task, it, it won't matter too much to you, right? So it's actually inherent in it, yeah? But with this, how does the composition and complexity of task affect team performance? There, there is a very strong literature actually showing that if you have a work breakdown structure that is non-rule associated, you don't arrive at the refinement of performance. So often what happens is you negotiate with your uh, other individuals kind of roles and then if you have another t uh, project that is very similar, then you have actually increase in performance because people just adapt to their uh, um, adapted role identifications. Yeah? But it's better to actually define roles and trim and work on the performance and then you have a lot higher uh, performance outputs and productivity uh, gains. Yeah? But again, in, in projects, this is not always what we can do. Now, this is often in our contractual setup. And this is actually not easy to do then. 
Now, there's this very element uh, in this research that looked at group composition. So how do uh, factors like team size, diversity, and experience of members impact work teams? And uh, um, be careful. This was initially very, very blunt. They literally just looked at different people thrown in. And uh, there, there was uh, one article in particular that is quite uh, stressful. Uh, um, it's, uh, they put uh, women into a, a phone, rec uh, um, phone call center having to respond. And before that, friends that kind of were very uh, um, happy to communicate to each other uh, because they were friends. And they were quite productive. But then uh, um, they noticed, actually, when they put somebody else in, the production went down in terms of communicating, but they answered more calls. So uh, initially, the research team thought, like, oh, this is decreased productivity. But actually, the employer was, this is brilliant. They are answering more calls. Fire the other one. No more friends at work. Yeah? So, uh, um, so that, that's a horrendous kind of notion of uh, um, the background for the teamwork. And have a look at the case study. So it's actually quite interesting. Yeah? So group composition, uh, if you have a uh, um, less diverse team and you do a repetitive physical task where you have to kind of work together, like a football team yeah, uh, um, initially trying to shoot a goal, then uh, um, similarity does help initially. Now, if you have similar teams and you want to surprise the other team, then diversity matters. Yeah? So there is first uh, homogeneity as a good factor, but then if you come to high performance, there is a limit yeah? because you, you don't have creativity anymore. So when it comes to design or problem solving, diversity is a huge enabler. Yeah? That this is, this is un, uh, so ha have a look if you're interested in this. It's slightly counterintuitive, actually, if you look at it. Yeah, and uh, particular uh, um, with experience and work teams, this seems to be one. Now, with diversity, you have as well small uh, increases in negotiations that have to happen because you have inherently more com uh, uh, conflict, right? So it depends as well how your group actually adjusts to that. Now, then we had as well the organizational context. Uh, what is the reward system and the form of supervision that the work team may experience? So here we had then soft forms of leadership. Right, if you are working through the handbook in, in the um, last session, right, uh, in the seventh uh, session uh, chapter, you kind of could see how we, we are talking suddenly about team participation, team member participation as a leadership style, right? And it's where situational leadership, where you actually look at their competence level and you are just there to kind of facilitate that they're actually doing something. Now, th those were supervision styles that didn't actually exist really to that level before that became very, very popular with this kind of team performance, right? So as well for, for you, if you're a project manager and you work with highly uh, expertise-based uh, teams or, or team members that are kind of recruited because they are the best player in that level, don't tell them what to do. They, they probably know this a lot better, right? You, you want to facilitate that they give you the best input for your project, right? So this is actually the, the challenge, yeah? Now you had as well internal processes, so this is the degree of collaboration or conflict in which teams members engage, and again there's a correlation to the group dynamic, right? Don't, don't uh, forget about that. Then the group psych psychological traits, I, I understand that you are covering this with Alan and Michelle in quite a lot of depth, but here the big questions were kind of how does cohesiveness and group norm development affect team performance? So this is as well Tuchman, right? So coerciveness is like, how do you actually work together? Yeah, how do you enforce each other? Or how do you penalize co uh, um, anti or, or uh, um, non-productive behavior, right? As a team member, if one just uh, um, consistently phones home and uh, talks to his or her girlfriend, boyfriend, whatever, yeah, and it doesn't actually uh, um, contribute to the team performance, yeah, then you will probably perceive that as very bad and say, hey, do you have to take all the calls during work time? Can we not push on with the task? We are behind on this. Yeah, then you as a team member maybe encourage them. Yeah, this is exactly what they observe, and this has a huge impact. Yeah, so if you look as well at the Toyo uh, um, Toyota teams, this was a famous one, the uh, most famous case study actually as well in the book, you can see that the teams increase productivity because they hold each other accountable for production, for commitment to work. So they actually don't start counting uh, um, work when you actually come to the factory, which companies have to do. As a team, they kind of said like, okay, we are now starting the work, and literally this is when they started counting the time and, and how productive they can be. Yeah, so th this, this has well enormous impact in terms of uh, um, 
team uh, dynamics, positive and negative, and I'll give you a few examples later. later. And uh, initially, the effectiveness uh, um, went, of course, initially up. Yeah, particularly if you introduce it as a new mechanism, it feels like autonomy. So you want to prove to your manager that you can do it as well, right? So how productive is your team? How much job satisfaction, uh, commitment, absenteeism, and turnover is there in the team? Yeah, so uh, um, those are normally perceived as statistical indicators on how well your organization is doing. So with uh, um, pushing your team too much, you, you lose people as well. Right, they go off sick or, or don't come back or uh, um, yeah, have, have less commitment. Yeah. Now, uh, with this, you had as well a new form of management perspectives. Advantages uh, for work teams include empowerment of workers, a more direct role in organization decision making. So this meant as well as a project manager, you would give the autonomy for decisions to your team yeah, on, on part decisions to inform you what the overall decision uh, would be. And you would be able to do the overall decision. So it meant as well you, you had reduced communication, reduced decision making. So this was actually a bonus for managers. Yeah. And a workforce uh, that is multi-skilled rather than de-skilled. Uh, um, so this is, in, by the way, this is a political term, multi-skilled in the UK. Yeah, uh, um, whilst in, in uh, Germany and France uh, are kind of celebrated as something good. But uh, um, so here you had teams where they could cover each other's work rules. Yeah, what wasn't actually uh, um, given in the past because you had the trades, right, or, or um, craft. That, that were actually in your organizations. So with this, you had this well holistic uh, team uh, synergies that often result in more innovative decision making. We, we had that a little bit uh, uh, when you think back of organizational systems, right? There, there was a lot in the literature on that. Um, then we had this well subordination of individual employees' agendas to collective tasks of the team. Uh, um, so uh, the autonomy works as well that you embrace kind of a culture where people can bring their input in, right? So if, if you all uh, um, co are committed as a team to wearing, uh, I don't know, black trousers and a white shirt, yeah, then we can do this without a problem yeah, because we have this uh, autonomy. Yeah? So, and this autonomy was actually quite powerful. So what, as a manager, may not look very sensibly, uh, um, uh, gives actually enough freedom and commitment to the overall performance of the uh, um, project organization, right? Now, uh, we, we had this well, this is continued. Higher quality uh, decisions as a result of the pooling of team members' talents. So you, you could actually see that they looked as well critical at their work. So where does it normally go wrong? And uh, your task is maybe something very simple, but depending on how well you are doing or how accurate you are, this may impact on a work colleague. Now, if you're working in a team, this is actually very meaningful to you. If you work individually, if you're a contractor and you come on site, then you don't really care, right? So there, there's a huge uh, uh, um, notion of uh, um, by, well, uh, just change of perspective and general awareness of how it impacts as a system. Now, with this came as well functional autonomy with little need, uh, um, oh, sorry, uh, uh, with little need for direct supervision and a greater commitment uh, of employees to organizational goals. So this was, again, the role uh, uh, identification that you recognize, yeah? So if we as a team are responsible for the performance, then we are well interested in the goals and we look at our activities with an uh, outcome perspective on the goals. Yeah? And uh, um, yeah, as a consequence uh, for managers, this was a win-win situation. You had actually increased uh, organizational productivity in many different industries. Yeah? So this was actually quite impressive. Now, there was as well uh, uh, critiques, of course, of uh, work uh, and teams. So this is uncritical celebration of work team virtues fed by team building industry. So there's actually a huge uh, problem as well with team building. So once you have a team approach and the organization is used to team working, people generally don't really improve performance. Uh, so there's a, have a look at the examples. <laughs> It's actually quite uh, daunting. So if you have a team performing repeatedly and you want to increase productivity, you're on very thin ground. Yeah, this is uh, a very difficult to do. Uh, so you can play around with performance. Yeah, so practicing, literally what, what you would expect probably increases uh, uh, performance. But if you look at it in terms of self-driven motives, people fall into their roles and work like this together with team members. 
Yeah, so uh, um, you, you really need to allow them to have reflective tools where they can see how they can actually uh, um, increase performance as a team. And this is actually very difficult. And teams as management by stress, uh, so increase in performance pressures in, in the team environment. So uh, um, yeah, there's a whole literature on good stress versus negative stress. And uh, as a nutshell, uh, um, it matters how a person perceives the stress. If they see the stressful environment as something like, yeah, now I can finally perform to my maximum, then it's brilliant. But if somebody's like, oh, so much work, and I, I don't know how to cope with it, then you, you have lost the point. If you increase the stress, you just basically uh, um, have no work commitment, or, or even the tasks that they're uh, assigned or roles that they're doing will probably suffer under this. Yeah? And teams create as well a, a system of uh, concertive control. Um, yeah, this is kind of Barker. So workers become objects of knowledge to themselves and other workers. So this creates as well an awareness. So you get as well a reputation potentially, right? If you're in a team, and uh, I don't know if you've done this. Yeah, so I used to row as well, and I, I was kind of the stroke person. So I, I would set the rhythm. Yeah, and for that you you don't have to be the strongest, but you have to be the mentally craziest. Yeah, so you must still think that you can win when everybody else in the boat has given up and said, like, "No, we will win." And then I go, oh, "He's crazy." Yeah, clearly it's true. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, um, so you become renowned to your colleagues. Yeah, and it works as well the other way around. If you have somebody that, that is lazy, they get a reputation that is lazy, even though they may not be lazy. Yeah, this is the point. So it sticks to you. So you you kind of are known as a hard worker, you may be known as lazy or, or as a crazy person. Yeah. So and, and again, this sticks to you with a certain association. Yeah. Now, uh, um, there was this way a big question about how do we actually assess work teams? So you may have noticed with your individual salary, this is a bad system, right? If you get paid individually, and your reward is basically uh, um, for getting promoted or showing what you have achieved so that you can get a promotion, then the team is kind of hindering, right? Now, so this is actually uh, um, not a solution to workplace problems. Initially, it was seen as a bonus for the employer. I said like, no, no, this was a team performance. How can you claim this was your achievement? And then they learned very quickly like, yeah, yeah, but I'm always in the successful project team, so I, I should get a promotion. And then the, so it turned around, but there's actually a whole hidden literature on how that mechanism initially hindered kind of uh, um, pay increase, yeah, and on the other side, kind of uh, was as well hindering for career. Yeah. But uh, on the other hand, uh, where well, it came actually for circles, so it can empower workers in the right context. Yeah. So it was as well an incentive. So teams learned actually to negotiate potential bonuses. Yeah. So what is if we perform this within the budget and time? and we, we have additional uh, qualities that, that we may be able to sell to the client, they could actually negotiate other premiums, right? But again, this depends on your organization if that is possible. Then you have to be uh, a need to be implemented correctly, not top down, but with uh, a worker input. Uh, yeah, so if, if you, so if it's kind of, uh, um, the manager says like, if you hit those targets and they are unachievable, then you can actually be super demoralizing, right? As a team, there's no point if you, you see your targets and it's like, whoa, this is not possible. We have never seen this achieved and you are demotivated actually. So you need the input of the workers. Yeah, this is very important, or your team really. And workers need training and team building skills. So this is another problem, particularly with high competing teams. If you bring experts together, they all want to shine in their expertise. But often you don't need their whole spectrum of expertise and uh, trickiness and complexity to achieve your product goal, right? So the goals are often kind of a, a, con well, a conglomerate of, of inputs, but limited inputs towards the goal, right? So there, there's a certain element with this that may actually hinder this. Yeah. yeah. Uh, let, let's take a pause or, or break here. Uh, did you have any questions so far at the team? Okay, quite a run through. This is kind of our main theoretical body. I, I have as well case studies for you now. Um, should we take this now? No, we'll do, do it later. So uh, um, in the seminar, we will have a look at uh, um, project management and the gathering together of individuals for a single purpose. And, and we, we work a little bit through scenarios. 
Um, part of the post protest organization is as well emotions. And, and we will have a look after the case study actually at this because this is as well something that is a hot topic for managers. Yeah, emotional intelligence and using as well your emotions authentic. So this will as well improve arguably your uh, leadership perception. Yeah, but we'll have a look at that after this. Did you have any questions so far through the team? Uh, arguably, this should be quite different from the psychological spin that you have with Alan, right? Because in psychology, you, you uh, will see that if you look at people, uh, people like to be social, yeah? so there, there are a lot of benefits for individuals to be in a team and associated to a group, but it creates actually from an organization point other dynamics. Yeah? So you have really two competing bodies of uh, literature if you want for the same topic. Did you have any recent examples of teamwork that you want to share? That they were maybe quite strong in terms of impressions that, that they left with you? Any teams that, that you have worked in recently? No? Is anybody following team sport? Newcastle, yeah. And are they doing well as a team at the moment? Yeah, yeah. After they joined up for the championship, like, suppose mm -hmm. you could say they're not doing very well at the moment because they're not in the Premier League, but when you look in the long term, they've got a lot going for them because they've got a really good manager, they've got a good squad, you know. Um, so, yeah, I mean, good to come anyway. But uh, uh, you're saying they're not doing so well uh, in, in the long run, but uh, um, they're doing very well in the championship, right? They're first. Uh, and, and as you're saying, they play as a team. Yeah? Uh, um, so I, I know a lot of colleagues here uh, that, that are as well Newcastle fans. And they say, like, oh, they're finally jailing as a team. Yeah? So it, it seems to pay actually off uh, in, in terms of performance. Yeah? It's good that it was the best thing for them was to get relegated because it's good for the. It's good to like read about the team, but at the same yeah. time, it's good for the fans who every Saturday and actually win it. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, it's more satisfying to go to yeah. the stadium if your team wins. Yes, it is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, this is one example. So here we have actually. So you are saying why, why? Why is it good that they redeveloped the team? Wasn't the other team stronger, arguably? Yeah, but I mean, even though the, they were stronger, like team morale and like chemistry and all just wasn't working, you know. So they yeah. needed like a new manager with a good vision and they needed players that actually like wanted to play for the club and stuff, you know. And oh I see. One. Yeah yeah. So this is quite so arguably you you're appealing here to the team, right? Jailing. So uh, um you have recognized that the restructuring of the team made it actually a, a more coercive team, right? So they, they're kind of working better together. They don't but have the big players, sorry, that yeah. they had last season, but they've got, you know, very good players that can actually work together and play as a team, and that's more important, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, but on. So, but this is, you, you have just recognized that on a side note, and that, that was actually what I was curious about. So they got rid of a lot of very famous players yeah. Yeah, with a huge reputation, but they are often uh, famous players because they are as well strong individuals. Yeah. Egotistic, you know. Yeah. In ways. Yeah. Yeah. Ego, egotistic or egoistic? Yeah. Egoistic. Sorry. Yeah. 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 You're quite right. So uh, um, it's it's as well. Uh, so if if you have a look at the team dynamics as well with the rowing example, uh, um, De Boer is actually talking a lot about uh, uh, Michael Jordan. Yeah. So he uses basketball, and uh, uh, Michael Jordan wanted to win. And he said, like, there is an I in win. And uh, because the coach said, there is no I in team. And then he said, like, yeah, but there's an I in win. So, uh, um, so a lot of uh, uh, very high performing team members are as well very strong individuals. And it can be so strong that the team actually cannot cope with it uh, very well anymore. Yeah? So, there, there is as well a, a dynamic regarding uh, individual char characters, particularly if you work with experts or specialists. Yeah, then, then this is quite likely to happen, that you have strong characters as well. Yeah. Yeah, okay, we, we keep it with that notion. Uh, thank, thank you very much. I, I see you in the seminar. 
Um, can I urge you again, all, if you can, have a look at least at both your peer review papers, yeah? because I, I can see that a lot of the papers aren't yet allocated. And uh, um, we had already one team where they got actually the peer review from their own paper. Yeah, so just make sure that you at least once have a look at the peer review so the automated system didn't work because two students didn't submit in time. So it basically had an odd number, so the allocations didn't work, and then it had a certain consequence. Is the, sorry, is the peer review deadline on Wednesday or Thursday? Yeah, uh, um, this is a good question. <laughs> have a look. Uh, yeah, Um, the 16th of March, 11.59, which is a Thursday. But if, if you can, just try to open it once, because the software is allocating you the reviews. So as you can see, there are a lot of senior re reviews yet, which means that you haven't yet clicked on it, so you haven't got an allocation. So it, it has created, uh, um, yeah. So if you had already had a look, you, you have your papers, and then you can review them, yeah? But if you have any difficulties, let me know. Uh, I have yeah. my own paper to review. So have you as well uh, done your paper with a peer? Yeah. Uh, the second then twice. So we, we have the same here. Uh, yeah, just write in a bubble in the paper, uh, this is my own paper. Yeah. So you don't have to review that. But you will have only one review then. This is uh, um, the drawback. So it's because yeah we have two students that didn't submit in time, so it randomized it from my initial setup. So this was quite bad. Um, yeah. But you you have one other one that is not yours. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah by the way, uh, um, a peer review takes me uh, one hour per review. So I've scheduled uh, um, for you in your workloads um, eight hours. Yeah. So you have a multiplier of four to review it. So if you take more than eight hours to peer review both papers, then you're doing it too extensively. So try to aim to take maybe three hours to work through it, maximum, yeah, to peer review. The point is you can spend actually a lot of time on a peer review. So make sure that you actually schedule the time, yeah, that you actually have a full peer review. Yeah. So again, you get 10 points for it if you are doing so. And then you will see a few of you got already their 10 points for submitting, right? So you should be able to see that already. I hope so, yeah? Yeah, uh, yeah I, I see it. Yeah. So you, you may have got just five if it's not the complete draft. Yeah, if something was missing, then I, I've taken points off. Yeah? Okay. Okay, if, if you don't have any questions, then I will see you at three, right? Yeah. yeah. And then we work through the case study. Yeah? Okay, super. Thank you very much.